Good morning. Good morning. In 2015, the Science and Security Board of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists moved the hands of the doomsday clock from five to three minutes to midnight. The board advanced the time out of a growing concern about the deterioration in relations between the United States and Russia, two countries that account for more than 90% of the world's nuclear weapons. It did so also for unchecked nuclear modernization programs in every nuclear state and a lack of global action in response to climate change. Every year, the clock is set by the renowned scientists and security experts who consider whether the planet is safer today than it was a year ago and compare to moments in recent history. In making the decision, the Science and Security Board consults with the Bulletin's Board of Sponsors, a group that includes 15 Nobel laureates. At today's event, we are delighted to have with us Thomas Pickering, a member of the Bulletin's Board of Sponsors, who holds the rank of career ambassador and has served the US as ambassador to the United Nations, the Russian Federation, India, Israel, El Salvador, Nigeria, and Jordan. David Titley is a member of the Bulletin Science and Security Board, an expert on climate change. Retired Rear Admiral Titley is a professor of practice in meteorology and a professor of international affairs at Penn State University. He is the founding director of Penn State Center of Solutions to Weather and Climate Risk. Lawrence Krauss is the chairman of the Bulletin's Board of Sponsors. He is the director of the Origins Project at Arizona State University and foundation professor at ASU School of Earth and Space Exploration and the Physics Department. He is an internationally renowned theoretical physicist and is the author of the, the forthcoming book, The Greatest Story Ever Told So Far, Why Are We Here? John Mecklin is in the audience with us. He is the Bulletin's editor-in-chief, and he's the one who pulled together and helped help the board develop the statement that accompanies this important announcement and can be found at the Bulletin's website at thebulletin.org. An op-ed by Lawrence and David that highlights the points we are going to make today can be found on the New York Times website. I'm Rachel Bronson. I'm the executive director and publisher of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, and I am delighted to be with you here today. Make no mistake, this has been a difficult year. The clock statement that is on our website makes clear that over the course of 2016, the global security landscape darkened as the international community failed to come to grips with humanity's most pressing existential threats, nuclear weapons and climate change. Today's speakers will go into greater depth on the key issues that we are focusing on. But perhaps most troubling has been two concerns that are adding to an already challenging global landscape. The first. The first has been the cavalier and reckless language used across the globe, especially in the United States during the presidential election and after, around nuclear weapons and nuclear threats. And the second is a growing disregard of scientific expertise, expertise that is needed when it comes to responding to pressing global challenges including climate change. There is a troubling propensity to discount and or outright reject expert advice related to international security, including the conclusions of intelligence experts. The board concludes in no uncertain terms that words matter in ensuring the safety and security of our planet. They are not the same as actions, but they matter a lot, especially when the risks of accident and miscalculation are so high. They have the ability to be walked back, but so too, as we have seen, influential actors alter their behavior in response to loose talk in ways that do not promote confidence and steady or smart decision making. In 2016, the board warned that three minutes to midnight is too close, far too close. Since then, inaction and brinkmanship have continued. Saber rattling and the rhetoric and loose but dangerous rhetoric have become almost commonplace.
to convey its concern about this unique moment and issue a call to leaders and citizens across the globe to put the world on a safer footing, the board takes the unprecedented step, the first time in its history, of moving the clock hand 30 seconds closer to midnight. Today, we move the clock a half minute closer to midnight. It is now two and a half minutes to midnight. And then if I can ask my colleagues to return to the podium, we can continue. Nuclear weapons have been at the center of our concern for many, many years. Predictability and continuity are prized when it comes to nuclear weapons policy because the results of miscommunication or miscalculation could be so catastrophic. Unfortunately, nuclear volatility has been and <clears throat> continues to be the order of the day. North Korea's continued nuclear weapons development, the steady march of the arsenal modification program in the nuclear weapon states, simmering tension between nuclear-armed India and Pakistan and stagnation in arms control are all of considerable concern. North Korea conducted two nuclear weapons tests, the second in September, yielding about twice the explosive power of the first. In January, uh, that test uh, took place. In his 2017 New Year's statement, Kim Jong-un declared that he would soon test a missile with intercontinental range. Modernization in, in nuclear stockpiles is underway in all nuclear states. Russia is building new silo-based missiles, the Bore class of nuclear ballistic missile submarines, and new rail mobile missiles as it revamps <coughs> other intercontinental ballistic missiles. The United States forges ahead with plans to modernize each part of its triad, bombers, land-based missiles, and nuclear missile-carrying submarines, adding new capabilities such as cruise missiles with increased ranges. As it improves the survivability of its own nuclear forces, China is helping Pakistan build submarine platforms. Pakistan and India continue to expand the number of weapons in and the sophistication of their nuclear arsenals, perhaps in the view of many posing the greatest danger for potential nuclear use. Nuclear rhetoric is now loose and destabilizing. During the election campaign, and as President Trump engaged in casual talk about nuclear weapons, suggesting South Korea and Japan might acquire their own nuclear weapons to compete with North Korea. We are more than ever impressed, as Rachel has just told you, that words matter, words count. The Iran nuclear deal has been successful in accomplishing its goals during its first year, but its future is in doubt under the new administration. There are observers and indeed analysts out there who have proposed that rather than tearing up the deal, uh, its principles specifically related to enrichment should be, paid mar should be made part of a new international gold standard. U.S. and Russia are at loggerheads on arms control and disarmament, with little prospect of reduction negotiations will resume. Let us hope that the new president and President Putin uh, can take uh, their relationship now budding to something further and more meaningful in the area of nuclear arms reduction. Thank you very much. Climate change should not be a partisan issue. 
The well-established physics of the Earth's carbon cycle is neither liberal nor conservative in character. The planet will continue to warm to ultimately dangerous levels so long as carbon dioxide continues to be pumped into the atmosphere, irrespective of political leadership. The current political situation in the United States is of particular concern. The Trump administration needs to state clearly and unequivocally that it accepts climate change caused by human activity as reality. No problem can be solved unless its existence is first recognized. There are no alternative facts here. So let me just go through a few of the specifics that cause the board to remain concerned and continue concerned about climate change. While global efforts to limit climate change have, have ultimately produced mixed results over the past year. Paris Agreement did go into effect in 2016 and countries are taking some actions to bring down emissions of greenhouse gases. There are also encouraging signs that global annual emissions were flat this past year in 2016, although right now there is no assurance that this heralds a break point. Continued warming of the world, unfortunately, as measured in 2016, underscores one clear fact. Nothing is fundamentally amiss with the scientific understanding of climate physics. Human activity is the primary cause of climate change. And unless carbon dioxide emissions are dramatically reduced, global warming will continue to threaten the future of humanity. 2016 was the warmest year on record, and it broke the record of 2015, which broke the record of 2014. In fact, 16 of the 17 warmest years on record have been recorded since 2001. This is much longer than any one period of El Nino or La Nina or any other oscillation. For local effects in the United States, we have seen catastrophic floods in Houston, Baton Rouge, along the Texas-Louisiana border, North Carolina, Ellicott City, Maryland. The rain bombs continue. At the North Pole, we have experienced this past winter multiple occasions in which the temperature has been at or near freezing. This is about 30 to 40 degrees warmer than an average case, and this happens again and again. More and more of the research in Greenland and Antarctica point to greater and faster sea level rise. Our intelligence community in September of 2016 highlighted six impacts of the threat of climate change. Stability of countries, heightened social and political tensions, adverse effects on food prices and availability, increased risk to human health, the negative impacts on investments and economic competitiveness, and potential climate discontinuities and secondary surprises here. Unfortunately, in 2016, the international community did not take the steps needed to begin the path towards a net zero carbon emissions world. The Marrakesh Climate Change Conference, for instance, produced little progress beyond the emissions goals pledged at Paris. As mentioned, the political situation in the United States is of particular concern. Uh, the Trump administration has put forward cabinets, uh, candidates for cabinet-level positions who foreshadow the possibility that the new administration will be openly hostile to progress towards even the most modest efforts to avert this catastrophic climate change. Climate change should not be a partisan political issue. The well-established physics of the Earth are neither liberal nor conservative in character. The international leaders need to refocus their attention on achieving the additional carbon emissions and carbon emission reductions that are needed to capitalize on the promise of the Paris Accord here. In summary, the United States, as a very first step, needs to make clear, unequivocal statements in the Trump administration that it accepts climate change. It's caused by human activity as a scientific reality. Alternative facts will not make the challenges of climate change magically go away. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I want to thank all of you for coming to what I believe is a particularly historic day. Now, in addition to the factors uh, that have long driven the clock, at least since I've been chair, namely nuclear weapons and climate change, the Bolton continues to monitor the possible existential threats arriving from new emerging technologies. And over the past year, two areas in particular have begun to stand out, cyber technology and biotechnology. In December, U.S. intelligence agencies concluded that Russia had intervened in the 2016 U.S. presidential campaign to help Donald Trump in ways that highlight the vulnerability of critical information systems in cyberspace. 
information monocultures, fake news, and the hacking and release of politically sensitive emails may have had an impact on the perceived legitimacy of the electoral process in the United States. Hacking is not new, but the question of whether the fabric of democracy may be imperiled by reducing faith in both the integrity of elections and in the very information on which an informed public can base their voting becomes suspect. It is, is at this level that cyber technology begins to represent a deeper global threat. Such attacks on the democratic process, however, represent just one near-term threat associated with the modern world's increased reliance on the internet and information technology. In the longer term, there are also causes for concern. Sophisticated hacking, whether by private groups or governmental entities, may have the potential to create grave and broad impacts, threatening national or international financial activities, national electronic power grids and plants, including nuclear power plants, and the personal freedoms that are based on the privacy of individuals at the core of democracy. Autonomous intelligent systems are evolving at a rapid pace as the introduction of self-driving vehicles demonstrates. While these do offer great opportunities, they also present possible threats. From economic threats, as a greater and greater fraction of the workforce may be replaced by machine learning systems, to the more immediate danger that military systems may come to rely more heavily on such systems and could result in inadvertent or malicious aggressive actions. In this sense, there's an intimate relation between our inappropriate reliance on nuclear arsenals and the need to maintain command and control in these systems. Lastly, on the biotechnology front, new CRISPR technology that allows precise DNA manipulation also holds out great hope for curing disease, but makes the ability to engage in malicious activities potentially much more accessible to groups and governments that don't have sophisticated biological laboratory infrastructures. Technological innovation is occurring at a speed that challenges society's ability to keep pace, even as many citizens lose faith in the institutions upon which they must rely to make scientific innovation work for them rather than against them. To return then to the themes that have led us to this moment, I want to emphasize the historical significance of today. The doomsday clock is closer to midnight than it's ever been in the lifetime of almost everyone in this room. The last time it was closer was 64 years ago, in 1953, after the Soviet, then Soviet Union exploded its first uh, hydrogen bomb, creating the modern arms race. More than that, this is the first time the words and stated policies of one or two people placed in high positions have so impacted on our perception of the existential threats we believe the world faces. This is a time of great opportunity and great potential challenge. Expert advice is crucial if governments are to effectively deal with complex global threats. The Bulletin is extremely concerned about the willingness of governments, including the current U.S. administration, to ignore or discount sound science, empirical evidence, and considered expertise during their decision-making process. Facts are stubborn things and they must be taken into account if the future of humanity is to be preserved. In 2016, world leaders not only failed to deal adequately with those threats, they actually increased the risk of nuclear war and unchecked climate change through a variety of provocative statements and actions, including careless rhetoric about the use of nuclear weapons, and in fact uh, threatened perhaps treaties like the Non-Proliferation Treaty by uh, by considering modernization of nuclear weapons, which may require nuclear testing. We call on these leaders, particularly Russia and the United States, to refocus in the coming year on reducing existential risks. In no small part, consulting with top-level experts and taking scientific research and empirical reality into account. In particular, U.S. and Russian leaders need to come together to begin to negotiate nuclear arms reductions. They need to consider reducing the alert level of nuclear weapons, which risks catastrophic accidents. They need to not embark on modernization programs, uh, which are expensive and destabilizing. And they need to engage countries like North Korea and discourage proliferation in countries like Pakistan and India. To step back further from the brink will require leaders who have both revision and restraint. 
President Trump and President Putin, who claim great respect for each other, can choose to act together as statesmen or act as petulant children risking our future. Regardless, these issues are too important to be left in the hands of a few men. We therefore call upon all people to speak out and send a loud message to your leaders that you will not allow them to needlessly threaten your future and the future of your children. To summarize, for the reasons we've laid out today, the Board has set the 2017 clock at two and a half minutes to midnight. We chose the doomsday clock 70 years ago because we feel it allows us a rare opportunity to reach the global public directly with an enduring icon and to raise the profile of urgent global existential threats that the public needs to be aware of to act responsibly. The future of the clock and our future is in your hands. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, we have concluded our statements. If there's any questions that we can take, we have some time for them. Yes, please. And please, your affiliation, too, would be helpful. Oh, you got away from the mic. Thank you. Sorry about that, Tracy. Tracy Wilkinson from the Los Angeles Times. Just to clarify, Mr. Krause, you said uh, this shouldn't be left in the hands of one or two leaders uh, making crazy statements. I know you mean Trump, but is the second person Putin, or did yeah. you mean the North Korea? Okay, Putin. Yeah. Okay, just wanted to clarify. Thank you. Thank you. A good guess. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many candidates. Yeah, that's it's true. <laughs> yes, thank you. Please wait for the mic. Hi, good morning. Steve Herman from The Voice of America. Um, you listed a, a category of um, threats uh, that prompted you to move the hands slightly forward. Uh, out of everything that you spoke about, from nuclear proliferation, North Korea, climate change, cyber threats. What was the single biggest factor that prompted you to move the hands forward? I think that we have an obligation to you to tell you that there is no single biggest factor. And the three or four that we focused on, the old traditional one of nuclear concerns is now joined clearly by climate change, but also by cyber and new scientific developments so beautifully elaborated here today by Lawrence. And so I think that rather than picking favorites, we hope you will pick the lot and tell people that it is the conjugation, if I can put it this way, the congregation of this set of activities that put us on the trail of further moving the hands forward. Let, let me just add one thing to Tom's cogent summary, which is exactly right. And that is that the current situation and the situation of the last few years has been dangerous and potentially unstable. But what we are seeing on top of all these factors is a new verbal response by world leaders, which is of great concern. And that is, uh, that is new and, uh, and, and, um, and recent. And it, and, it, and, it, and it played a role in our, it, it, to compound all those factors in, in causing us to, to move the clock forward. And, and that's really a, a combination of not only uh, very loose talk about very, very dangerous weapons, but simultaneously uh, an active and blatant disregarding of, of basic facts, basic scientific facts, and really basic uh, looking for expertise or the acknowledgement and acceptance of, of factual expertise. So, so the words, again, span, as, as Tom mentioned, these multiple categories. Uh, so when we take all of that, the board advanced the clock 30 seconds. Maybe I could just add one word uh, to put salt <clears throat> in the wound I hope we have created. The notion that the scientific method uh, as a non-scientist but a great respecter of science is now totally irrelevant is in itself a, a disastrous and self-defeating conclusion. All the way in the back there. Just please wait for the mic. Yes. Yep. Just wait, wait for the mic, please. It's on its way. And introduce yourself. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Priya Reddy. I'm from RT America News, and um, I actually have two questions. One, uh, what is your response to this um, up upgrading in arsenal that both uh, Russia and the United States have pledged to, and what would you recommend al alternatively? And second, um, you said that technology surpasses society's ability to keep up with it. Um, do you mean that the lessen, lessening of democracy and the rise of authoritarianism affects the way technology may be used or misused? Um, and this disregard for science does play into that. Um, so what are the implications if the public doesn't really understand the impl uh, implications of the technology itself? Maybe uh, have a certain acquaintance with Russia. I could answer the U.S.-Russia equation okay. question. Um, I think it is obvious that full bore major efforts uh, to re-emphasize and to rebuild uh, the nuclear arsenal uh, in the face of complete abandonment of a long history that goes back to the Cuban Missile Crisis and before of the United States and the then Soviet Union, now Russia, leading the path to reduce our nuclear weapons from a total above 60,000 to Dow down around 12 to 14,000 has much more work to be done. Um, and there has already been proposed that at least 1,000 or 900 be the target for the next reduction. Uh, and that that might also include reserve and dismantled weapons in one way or another, so that it is a true measure of the nuclear weapons on both sides. And that has gotten stuck. It's gotten stuck over U.S.-Russia differences. It's gotten stuck, unfortunately, over Mr. Putin's interest in not further talking about this question. So rather than to go up, it is time to continue to build down. Let me, let me expand on that. There are close to 15,000 nuclear weapons in the world. The United States and Russia each have at least 5,000 weapons apiece. Workable weapons that are, in fact, in, that, that our national laboratories ensure each year that a safeguard and, and ensure are workable. There is no rational reason to need a greater arsenal than 5,000 weapons. Already it's excessive, far more than the world needs. That's the first thing. But the second thing is that the non-proliferation treaty not only required countries that don't have nuclear weapons to not obtain them, but required the nuclear states in the world to work towards disarmament. By, we are essentially risk, continually risking violating that treaty by not moving towards that goal and an explicit effort to modernize weapons, which will put pressure on this country and, in, and Russia to test weapons, will be a radical and dangerous new move, which I, which I think would be very, a very clear violation of that treaty. If we expect non-nuclear states to not want to obtain nuclear weapons, we have to demonstrate that we believe they're not important. And by modernizing, we, we demonstrate exactly the opposite. To answer your question about, the, about technology, it's a many-faceted area. Technology is evolving in ways that are, uh, in the current climate, changing at, at, at an incredible rates. There is, as you pointed out and as I pointed out, a new connection between evolving technology and the nature of democratic institutions and, and the ability of governments to manipulate information that is of great concern. But there are key questions that need to be addressed. Fortune favors the prepared mind. And we can, while it is true that one might not say that there is an existential threat associated with new cyber and artificial intelligence technology and biotechnology, it is easy to foresee possible existential threats. And it is important to think in advance how we might create institutions that can, can control them, which is one of the reasons why the, the Bolton has urged governments to create such institutions to explore those possibilities, because it'll be too late once they're out. And Lawrence, if I can pick up on that and, and um, elaborate. We focus here in particular today a lot on the threats. At, at the heart of what the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists is about is identifying scientific advancements that have the, pen, the potential to, as we've come to learn, destroy the planet, but also make it a significantly better place, safer and more healthy. And so there's enormous optimism in technological advancement. If we can focus on ensuring that the negative consequences of that advancement 
are lessened and reduced, it will be a safer and healthier place. And we feel that it's imperative that we focus on these risks so that they don't come to fruition and we're able to reap the benefits of technical, technological evolution. Our founders in 1945 witnessed the horror of nuclear tests. They also understood the potential of nuclear power, a green energy, if you will, that had the potential to electrify the planet. But they understood then that there was no way we would be able to realize the, that benefit if we couldn't contain and address those risks. I think climate change fits in perfectly with that. Technological advancements have allowed billions across the planet to come out of poverty. It's a very, the, the, the car and its enormous um, benefits that it brings. But if we're not attentive to the risks, we can destroy the planet. And so for these new emerging technologies, we feel it our responsibility to start a conversation about what kinds of institutions, as Lawrence mentioned, need to be built now so that we continue to benefit from cyber, the benefits of cyber technology, artificial intelligence, that will bring so much advancement, but so much risk if we don't pay closer attention and build the institutions that are required now. Let me add to the, that beautiful statement by reinforcing the statements that Tom and David have also made that, that policy that is sensible requires facts to be facts. And the Building the Atomic Scientist has that name because the, one of the things we want to do is to be there to provide the facts as the basis of policy, not to make policies. But sensible policies cannot be made unless we all accept that facts are facts. People can have their own opinions, but not their own facts. And the best thing we can do is to promote for the public and the world leaders what those facts are so that sensible, rational decisions can, can be taken place that will take us back from the brink. Great, thank you. Yes, please. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I'm Martin Fleck. I'm the Security Program Director at Physicians for Social Responsibility. And um, I understand that the Bulletin will be having a, a briefing on Capitol Hill later today. It is my sincere hope, in fact, I was hoping I would see here today the chairs and ranking members of Senate Armed Services and House Armed Services. And I hope that they appear, make an appearance. But uh, my question for you is, if they were here, uh, Congress obviously plays a role in uh, the movement of the clock. How would you advise them? I'll just start. I'm sure my colleagues will also have uh, thoughts in this regard. Uh, and, I, and I'll talk mostly about climate change on this. We, we have seen now eight years of what happens when an administration by itself, really without any congressional support, tries to move climate uh, risk and the management of climate risk forward. Little bits and pieces can be done, but as we all know, our Constitution's pretty clear on who passes laws and who has the budget. You know, and, and for extra credit, it's not the administration, it's not the executive branch, it's the Congress. So if you want real change in this country, the Congress has to be on board. And the Congress, when they are motivated to do so, has been extremely constructive. I come from the Navy, the Navy loves to take credit for nuclear power on submarines. Fact of the matter is, is the Navy went kicking and screaming into this. The Congress made them do it. Now, of course, they, they take full credit for it. So for climate, uh, for nuclear arms reduction, for the management of innovative and new technologies that, as we've talked about, have both uh, significant upside but also very significant risks, we need the Congress to thoughtfully engage with the administration to collectively work on what is best for our country and, frankly, for the world uh, so that we can manage the risk of climate change in a way that we get ourselves to a zero carbon economy and do so while, while maintaining our economy and, frankly, increasing our quality of life. Uh, that is not, in my opinion, going to happen with, and unless and until the Congress becomes actively engaged in this challenge. Perhaps I could jump in, and maybe Lawrence and Rachel will have things to say, too. Um, the answer to your very fine question is, how much time do we have? Uh, and the really interesting things I would put at the top of the list are, first and foremost, 
to look very carefully at the new proposals and ideas uh, for, in fact, enlarging uh, and changing uh, the nuclear posture. And look at some of the things that Lawrence mentioned. Can we increase decision-making time? Can we find more stability in the deployment and indeed the arrangement of our uh, deterrent on both sides, I have to add? Separation of missiles and warheads and things of that sort. Wise things that have been suggested by real experts in this area. The second question is, can we get nuclear reduction negotiations begun again <clears throat> between the U.S. and the Russia? And Russia? And can we, as a result of that, begin to include the other states, uh, China, Britain, France, India, Pakistan, Israel, at some point in this, because they're going to have to join? Third question is, can we get the nuclear test ban treaty ratified? Lawrence is entirely right, and I agree with him, that the, the non-proliferation treaty says we will not build up. It says we will move toward eliminating. And so testing is a primary function of building up, not eliminating. Uh, but the test ban treaty adds to that. And that's under threat these days, mindlessly under threat, because we are still ahead. Uh, and being ahead means freezing in this area and a combination of our ability to improve and strengthen and make secure the existing arsenal without testing is a proven fact now. Finally, I'm sitting next to a naval uh, officer. I was a naval officer. Ratification of the Law of the Sea Treaty will begin to remove one of those obstacles, the South China Sea that we profess adherence, but we ought to move, and of course the Arctic, uh, as Admiral uh, Titley just reminded me, is an important piece of that. And I could go on, but let me just leave those on the top of your list if I can. Let me, let me add, um, specific, we've already sort of said specific actions that can take place, but I, some of those actions I'm not even sure Congress is aware of, the public isn't aware of. The fact that we have a large fraction of our nuclear weapons on high alert status means raises the possibility of an accidental nuclear war, which has almost happened a number of times in its history. Every, it, it's interesting that the last two presidents, Obama and George Bush before him, before they came into office, argued that that alert status should be changed. It was never changed. That's something that, that the administration can do unilaterally to make this world safer. The other thing is that we're in a time where there's a lot of talk of spending trillions of dollars on a variety of things, including infrastructure programs and some fraction of that maybe on a wall. The, the modernization of nuclear weapons is, is going, is, could cost up to a trillion dollars. It's not, it, it is a devastatingly large economic program that has limited rationality. Congress can choose to spend money in better ways, and by choosing to not embark on modernization, there would be a huge impact. And, and, and finally, the, Tom mentioned it, but maybe people don't realize this country has not ratified the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. It's one of several countries that hasn't. We haven't tested nuclear weapons, but we haven't ratified that treaty. Ratifying that treaty would go a long way and is something Congress could do. Oh. I'm so sorry. I, don't, I can't see you over there. Please, I'm sorry, sorry about that. Please, and if you could stand and introduce yourself. Erin Ross, Nature Magazine. And maybe this seems trivial, but why the decision to only move it 30 seconds? Is it just not as severe as 1953? Is that like this asymptote that we'll just never approach? <laughs> it, it, well, look, there's always a question every year of, of, of what. But there are several, and maybe Rachel can add on to this. There were several factors. The world is a more dangerous place. And one of the thir concerns was the, the verbiage that's happening. Uh, but it is now only six or seven days into a new administration. And actions do speak louder than words. And w we wanted to send a message that, that, that things are not going in the right direction. It's the derivative of the clock that really matters more than its absolute value, I think we, we tend to realize. And the point is that 30 seconds or a minute, this is... This puts the clock, this is historic, and I want to emphasize that. The clock has not been closer to midnight in 64 years, a lot older than you are. And, um, and so we felt that, that, it, it, that things are inching in a more dangerous path, but, but the, we try not to act on the moment. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, based on policies of this week or next week, 
We can decide again next year what to do, but things are getting worse, and it seemed appropriate to point out they were getting worse. But Yeah, just around the new year, you might remember that the foreign minister of Pakistan uh, tweeted out a, a very blustery statement about Pakistan's nuclear capabilities as a result of fake news, um, a, a, new story, a fake news story out of Israel. The bulletin felt that it was imperative that at this moment, in, in a very threatening environment, much of which we captured when we moved the clock from five to three minutes to midnight, much of which we're talking about now are not all, but much, are, are things that drove the clock from five to three. But there's something different happening. The words being used are very careless. And there's a sense, well, they don't matter. We don't need to take them seriously. And yet we can see evidence of leaders and countries taking action based on words because they're suggesting a direction. So how do we convey our concerns about that? How do we stay true to our heritage, which has looked at actions taken, treaties signed, reductions happening, and speak about and acknowledge that that's what we're looking at, but that we're very concerned about the direction of the statements being made because they suggest a worrying trend. And that's what the board spent considerable time discussing in the meetings and conversations we've had around the clock time. We've never moved the clock a half minute, 30 seconds. And so this, we recognize, would be very new. And we anticipated a question. And we hoped that this change, if you will, in, in quantity, this change of moving a half a minute would drive a question like that. And the bulletin felt that it was actually quite important to say words do matter. And they do count, especially when the stakes are so high. Risks of uh, accident and miscommunication are so high. And the expertise needed is it has to be precise in so many of the things that we're talking about. And so this half minute was something we felt very strong and comfortable with because it suggested this, this new uh, introduction of a, of, a, of a new set of factors that we hadn't considered before. Thank you for the question. Yes, please. I'm uh, Joshua Keating from Slate Magazine. Uh, I was wondering if you could compare a little bit the level of threat and the type of threat now to uh, the early 1950s, the last time the clock was this close. I mean, uh, how are the nature of the threats we face uh, similar or different than how they were then? I perhaps am the only person here who was conscious and alive <laughs> in the 1950s, much to your good fortune uh, and my aging. Uh, and I will tell you that the explosion, not just of the hydrogen bomb, but of the 50 megaton bomb by the Soviet Union was an unnerving and spectacularly difficult problem, but compounded as it was in the 60s uh, by the Cuban Missile Crisis, which pointed out that not only do words matter, but actions matter. Words in that case were to mask and hide uh, what was going on with respect to the deployment of Cuba, to Cuba, and clearly to mask and hide the fact that quite uh, obviously now from the facts, local authority for use in circumstances of uncertainty, if I could put it that way, was delegated in a situation which compounded and increased the unnerving impact of that set of concerns. And so we are now equally concerned by, one, the potential for growth rather than reduction, the potential for words being taken at face value, the potential for our words about reality, science, and analytical conclusions of merit uh, not being taken as seriously and as importantly as they must be. And so, if anything, uh, while my memory is getting more fragile with age, uh, the comparison that Rachel gave you and that Lawrence and David here have so cogently explained is, in my view, a real one. And it takes us back, unfortunately, in comparative terms, to an age of great uncertainty. 
Uncertainty when we believe that hiding under desks could somehow help us deal with the nuclear danger. Uncertainty when we felt building more weapons was the answer, and the race took us to 60 to 70,000. Uh, 1,500 is an unfathomably large number. Why in the hell would you want to have, you know, 50 to 60,000 combined on both sides in a race to see that the counting game somehow provided you with some benefits? So it is a call on our part for sanity, uh, for science, for realism, uh, for, I hope, cogent and sensible leadership uh, that we're here today. Let, let me add two things um, to that. One is that, as, as uh, Tom just said, and as I said in my remarks, <coughs> 1953 was the beginning of an arms race, when, uh, uh, of a dangerous arms race. This is, in, in recent memory, the first time we potentially are beginning another arms race. The, the words and the modernization programs of the superpowers, the nuclear superpowers, suggest that we may be, in that sense, in a similar time, uh, equally irrationally. So that's the first thing that I want to say. The second thing is, uh, since I've been chair, we've, we've, there is a difference between now and 1953. The bulletin looks at things beyond nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. and, 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 we, and climate change is, is a key factor. And so that's a, a fundamental difference. And when we look at the world, not only were we about nuclear arms race, but we're, we're extremely concerned about being in the threshold of climate change. So that's a, that's a very clear difference. And, and that impacts on our, on our decisions as well and means that the world faces existential threats we didn't face six, 60 or 70 years ago. And, and then, as I mentioned, there are new emerging existential threats. So, so uh, there's a whole slate of things that, that, that we have to face with our eyes wide open if we're going to uh, prevent, deal with, and hopefully lead to improvements rather than, rather than uh, perils. In, in 1953, most, many scientists thought that the ocean would actually take up all the carbon dioxide and, and everything was going to be fine. Uh, we, we subsequently, throughout the 50s, learned that that was not the case. And of course, the iconic Keeling curve uh, showed that, in fact, the atmosphere was, was uh, accumulating larger and larger amounts of carbon dioxide. So as, as Lawrence has mentioned, as Ambassador Pickering have mentioned, that this threat, this risk, is continuing to accelerate. So in addition to everything that's been said about uh, a potential restarting of an arms race with nuclear weapons, uh, this risk of climate change and the fact that although the science community absolutely understands it and they understand its threat, uh, the political community has really not taken this to account yet. And a combination of all of these is why we see at, at the board, at the bulletin, uh, the clock back to levels not seen in over 60 years. Ladies and gentlemen, we're at the end of our, our, our time. Uh, to learn more about what we've talked about today, you can see the statement, uh, which is available on our site at thebulletin.org. We urge you to come and take a look at that. Uh, we greatly appreciate your interest in it, and if this, uh, if this announcement helps generate the global conversation on these key issues, we think it's a first step in making the planet a safer place. So thank you very much. Thank you.